Hello, and my name is Harry Kazianis. I'm the executive editor of The National Interest. Today, I'm welcome with a very special guest who's taken the time out of his busy schedule to join us and to join our, our readers around the world. Uh, I am here with the Republic of China, or Taiwan's representative to the United States, Dr. Lu Shan Shen. Uh, Ambassador, first of all, thank you very much for, for coming in today. We really appreciate it. I know you're a very busy man with a very mm -hmm. busy schedule, so this is a great opportunity to speak to you about all things Taiwan and Asia. So thank you for that. I want to thank you too. It is a very good opt opportunity for me to express you know, our position and other things. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank so, you. Thank, thank you. you. So I guess the first question mm -hmm. I'd like to start out with is mm -hmm. the APEC summit. Okay. Very, very important summit. A lot of different things came mm -hmm. out of it. Mm -hmm. Obviously, there was some very important U.S.-China dialogue. Uh -huh. uh, give us your take. Do you feel that the, the talks between the United States and China were successful? Give us sort of your analysis. Okay. I think whether it's successful or not, it depends on the two sides. Mm -hmm to make conclusion sure. or assessment. My perspective is Taiwan's view mm -hmm. about this summit. Of course, you know, our concern is whether our interests, you know, whether have been compromised mm -hmm. or affected. Sure. But it seems to me now, and not just to me, but to, to, to our perspective, to our interests, that nothing has been uh, compromised or uh, damaged. Mm -hmm. uh, usually we would worry about whether Taiwan's interest, you know, the U.S. relations with mainland China, whether it will be improved at the cost of Taiwan. Mm -hmm. But this time it seems it's not. Uh, both uh, in terms of public statements and the, also the, the briefings we, we got from American side, mm -hmm. from American authorities. And uh, not only uh, that our interests have not been affected uh, uh, negatively, but we also uh, have seen some improvements. For example, in the public statement, you know, this is uh, from President Obama, uh, right, he said in Beijing, right in the beginning of the press conference, so we appreciate that, that very much. For example, he said the United States encourages the uh, further progress of the cross-strait relationships. You know, between two sides, Taiwan Straits, to reduce tension, uh, to uh, to uh, promote stability. Okay, the key words here is on the basis of dignity and respect. What do they mean? Later, we were briefed by American side that these two words, dignity and respect, basically, the Americans trying to tell the mainland the Chinese that they ought to let Taiwan have more dignity in the international arena. You know, they used, Beijing used to try to block mm -hmm. our international participation. Mm -hmm. You know, then make Taiwan like an international non-person. We're not a member of the UN, we're not a member of most international organizations, and we don't get diplomatic ties with most countries, in other words, in, 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 in other part of the world. Um, but now this, this word dignity and respect, respect is also important. I think the United States is trying to tell Beijing that they ought to respect more of Taiwan's public opinions mm -hmm. and Taiwan's people's uh, general attitudes about the future mm -hmm. and Taiwan's full democracy. So these two key words, I think we, uh, as we see them, as, uh, as quite improvements. And not only have our interests not been affected, uh, but we also have this uh, very positive words, and so we're very grateful. And then, uh, from that perspective, we think our interests um, not not only um, have not been affected, but also been well preserved in okay. that sense, and okay. even promoted to a certain extent. Excellent. Okay. Okay. So um, moving, keeping sort of. W with similar uh -huh. mindset, uh -huh. thinking a little bit about the U.S. pivot to Asia, it was very uh -huh. b b b happily and, b and sort of broadly announced uh -huh. in 2012. Mm -hmm. The president went to, to Australia. There's a lot of talk about that the United States has sort of reemerged in the mm -hmm. Asia Pacific. Mm -hmm. uh, but one of the things that I think that maybe has been overemphasized is maybe the military dimension. Right. And I think now there's a consensus here in Washington that the economics of that pivot really need to be mm -hmm. sort of the foundation going exactly. forward. So thinking about the economics, obviously the Trans-Pacific Partnership mm -hmm. is a very key component of that. Mm -hmm. So what I'd like to ask Mr. Ambassador, I'd like to get your sense of the Trans-Pacific uh -huh. Partnership. Okay. And furthermore, do you think Taiwan could be a part of it now or in the future? 
I think Taiwan deserves to be a part of it. Why? Because not only in Taiwan's interest, it's also in the interest of the United States and the other TPP members. Because Taiwan's too big to ignore. Can you imagine that among 224 countries or territories, the United States is trading with now? Taiwan last year ranked number 12. Number 12 is quite a big big deal because you, you're trading with 224. And this year, for the first nine months, as we have seen the figures released by US Department of Commerce, we became number 11. Guess which country we overtook as number 11? My dear friend, India. You know how big India is. Wow. But how could you ignore a trading partner even bigger than India? Okay? And then, then let me tell you, if we Okay, this is Pacific. I was transferred from London. I spent more than 10 years in Europe. Can you imagine that among 28 EU member states, there are only three are bigger than Taiwan as a trading partner to the United States? They are just UK, France, and Germany. We're bigger than Italy. We're bigger than Netherlands. We're bigger than Belgium. We're even bigger than Russia or big, bigger than Australia as a trading partner of the United States. How could you ignore Taiwan? If you don't have Taiwan, your system cannot be called, called complete. So as simple as that. Now, TPP, as we know, you know, today you have to try to facilitate more trade investment. The world is getting smaller and smaller and more and more complicated. And almost every region, you need this kind of system. So we, we hope this can be made you know, of course, you have some of your domestic problems. And, and then from Taiwan's side, we, I think we have to make ourselves ready. We are now in the process of uh, doing a lot of deregulation and uh, also try to, uh, to open up uh, Taiwan's investment market even more, make the Taiwan investment environment uh, attractive to American and to other foreign investors. And don't forget, Taiwan also plays another role, very important, because we are probably the best gateway into the big China market, all right? Before President Ma came to office six years ago, there was zero direct flight between two sides of Taiwan Strait. Today, believe it or not, every week, just week, one week, we have 1,656 direct flights. We fly into 64 Chinese cities. We already outnumber Hong Kong as the largest source of external flights into mainland China. And this is why we often, be, and then we know their people. We speak the same language. And we can be probably the best partner for American businessmen to go into China market. Now, you already get benefited because we have suddenly have so many flights. So what do we need? What do we need? We need an aircraft. Mm -hmm. I went to Seattle last month for the delivery ceremony of the first Boeing 777-300ER we bought. Mm -hmm. This is the first one out of 17. And you know how big that deal is, okay? ER stands for extended range. Mm -hmm. And then, oh, this is beautiful. You, you see the... This is a state of the art, you know, marketing te te technology. But inside that core is the Song Dynasty flavor. Song Dynasty is around the 12th century uh, time, you know, famous for calligraphy and blue and white China. Very literal uh, dynasty. So uh, we're talking about Taiwan not only itself, and also, you know, as a gateway to mainland China. And Taiwan itself is not so small. Let me help you to put things in perspective, okay? Mainland China, by territorial size, is 265 times the size of Taiwan. They are even bigger than the United States, you know. Mm -hmm. Their population is 58 times larger. They have 1.3 billion, the most populous country in the world. We have 23 million. But in terms of, as a market for American goods, I ask my American friends, I usually ask the, the, the image, how big the China market is. You know, that was one of the reasons why the United States normalized relations, recognized mainland China, the big China market. Now, how big the China market is compared with Taiwan market to Americans? I ask my American friends, so far, very interesting. The largest number I got is, just, oh, mainland China is so big, so huge. It must be 100 times. And uh, one time I hosted a bunch of China experts 
and they're very serious in this discussion sure. just among themselves. Sure. And then they told me it's probably between 20 to 30 times. Okay? The big China market, Taiwan's so small, tiny, dinky, remote island. But the real number, according to the US Department of Commerce figures, is only 4.4 times. Hmm. For the first nine months of this year, I give you the figures also in my paper. Total US export to mainland China for the first nine months of this year is 86.9 billion US dollars. And the same period you export to Taiwan, 19.7 billion dollars. So it's only 4.4 times. Now, if you shorten that period for the first half this year, they're also 4.4 times. We probably can keep that figure 4.4 times, even though they are 265 times larger in terms of land, 58 times larger in terms of population. So that explains to you why Taiwan should not be uh, left out mm -hmm. in the TPP. And then, of course, there are so many technical problems we have to, uh, we have to uh, address. You know, we already started. Hopefully, we can, building, we can start building blocks. For example, one out of 29 chapters TPP, one of them is the uh, e-commerce. Mm -hmm. You know, Taiwan is a very big high-tech country. And uh, um, uh, so this is something we both need. Uh, some of your you know, big internet, big companies try to get into Taiwan to set up data center. For example, Google already did that. So you also need us to liberalize more of our market, to deregulate more of our old regulations. So I think we help each other. And so, so this, I would say, TPP is in our mutual interest, also in the interest of other members. So this will be a win-win-win situation. But if you leave Taiwan out, it will be unthinkable, my dear, my dear sir. Well, sticking, um, sticking. I'm with, sorry, I gave you a long answer. No, I know we appreciate it. I'm, I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure all of our, our national interest readers will as well. So let's stick with economics for a moment. Mm -hmm. Let's think a little bit more about t going beyond TPP because TPP could have some problems. Could take years to to, right, to get right, into right. play. What other ways could Taiwan and the United States maybe bring to fruition even more mutually beneficial uh -huh. relationship in terms of trade? What would be some, some points and in, in suggestions you would make in that regard? I would say first, educational relationship. You know, today, the reason why Taiwan can be like Taiwan today, one of the reasons because we have so many American return students. That's how we change a country. Our president is a Harvard SJD. The prime minister who just resigned, the Yale PhD. I don't know how good American PhDs are these days, you know, given Taiwan's politics. But still, I think that's uh, something that helped Taiwan's modernization. And if you remember, the, about 15 or 20 years ago, our then president, Li Denghui, trying to go back to his alma mater mm -hmm. and Cornell University and of course the international Instant and the mainland China was very angry by, by testing missiles against us. But it means that if you want to have a modern country, modern society, you have to send your, your younger generation. Today it's not just best and brightest, maybe the general, you know, younger generation to see the world. I have to tell you because I've been transferred from Europe, I think there are more and more Taiwan students going there than coming here. It's not bad because, you know, like UK, you also, you know, they have some very good you know, advanced areas for young, young youngsters to pursue their studies. But all in all, you know, this country is still so far the most powerful country in the world. And then uh, during my days, 40 years ago, when I was a student here, there were about 25,000 Taiwanese students in this country in the late 70s, around that time. At one time, I think we even the biggest foreign student body. But today, we're probably the sixth largest. That time, we had only about six stu 600 students in UK. But today, there are about 20,000 there, only 21,000 here. So I think we need to catch up here. We also have to help each other. And then the, um, um, this educational link we very important. Can you imagine? Today, if you walk into Taiwan's cabinet meeting, you feel like this is an American University Alumni Association. Can you imagine someday if you walk into 
the People's Republic of China's cabinet, if she was this like American college uh, alumni associate, and then you change the whole country, you change the, the whole society virtually. American MBAs today probably become a must if you want to do business, uh, not just in Taiwan, but in, 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 in Asia. Mm -hmm. And, and then things like that, I, I would emphasize the educational links. You know, this is a, probably not something uh, that you see the immediate result, but in the long run, mm -hmm. it's very important. Um, of course, the other things I would also emphasize is probably also in the long run. I have to emphasize that Taiwan probably can offer three largest, not only to Taiwan itself, but also to, to the United States. What are these three largest, the three L's? First, Taiwan is the largest single external investor into mainland China. Mm -hmm. You know, today we, not only our people invest heavily, we also create millions of jobs in mainland China. For example, a company, a Taiwanese company called Foxconn, mm -hmm. that company alone has created more than one million jobs in mainland China, okay? Okay, that's number one. Number two, we are the largest single external source of knowledge about China. We know, we know them better than anybody else. History, culture, everything. And then we're also the largest single external source of influence over China. Why I emphasize this educational links? Before President Ma came to office, there were only about 800 Chinese, mainland Chinese students in Taiwan. Today, there are 25,000. Can you imagine if someday you walk into Beijing's cabinet, most of them, either the American college graduates or Taiwan college graduates, and then what kind of world are you going to have? So I want to emphasize that Taiwan, the three largest, really would be American strategic mm -hmm. assets, mm -hmm. if you know how to manage these resources in the American rebalancing Asia strategy. As simple as that. Okay, fair enough. Okay. So I will, I, my final question for you, sir, would, would be this, moving on uh -huh. to more security and defensive matters. Right. Uh -huh. So obviously Taiwan is looking to always have a, a strong military and, and deterrent capability. When it comes to those issues, the issue of submarines has come out quite a bit in the press. Right, right, right. Uh, a lot of talk about maybe Taiwan developing its own indigenous submarine capabilities. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you see it in terms of Taiwan keeping up a, a very strong defensive posture, but obviously not making, creating any more regional tension? Okay, first of all, you know how many submarines uh, the People's Republic of China's Navy, Navy fleet has? A lot. A lot. And some of them, you know, very advanced. You know, how many submarines we have in our Navy? So how could we create a regional tension? Mm -hmm. They have almost 70. They're going to outnumber US Navy in terms of number of submarines, even though some of them are obsolete. Mm -hmm. Okay? And some are very advanced. This is funny, you know, they classify the, the, the class of the submarines by the names of Chinese dynasties. Mm -hmm. So it's Song Dynasty, for us is a blue and white porcelain vase. To them, is a class of submarine. Mm -hmm. So mean, you know. Say. We sometimes jokingly said someday they probably would exhaust all the dynasty names. They would have to come to the Republic of China. <laughs> anyway, we only have four submarines in our Navy. Two of them were made by the Dutch mm -hmm. 30 years ago. The two American made, my dear friend, it's probably older than your grandfather. <laughs> it was World made in 1943, yes. already 71 years old. Yes. I'm not talking about, you know, arms race or whatever. You know, we're just simply talking about safety, security of the sailors. Mm -hmm. you, know, you don't use it. it, it, it you're using submarines uh, made in 1943. It's like your Air Force, you still use P-51 Mustang. Mm -hmm. Well, this, this is ridiculous. And you have to say, you have to worry about safety, to say the very least. And then we've been waiting for 13 years. Well, actually, we've been given uh, permission uh, as early as 2001 uh, from the American side. At that time, I think there's also uh, a, a 
an understanding that as many as eight submarines, you know, we can we can buy. But the United States no longer produces conventional right. diesel submarines, right. so this becomes a problem. As, as you can see, mainly China probably trying to block our other other international uh, sources. So this being uh, this has been dragging on for 13 years. I think we couldn't wait for too long. There's already 71 years of submarines. And if we wait for another 13 years, that submarine, two submarines, will be 84 years old. Now, I, I, you, what, you, want to say, you, you probably don't want to even pay a visit to, to a submarine. <laughs> yeah. So as simple as that. Sure. So I think we, um, I, I'm not a, a submarine expert. I can only talk about the general situation. You know, I think. In Taiwan's technological uh, capability, we probably can make our uh, submarines, so long as the United States is willing to provide a technical assistance or let us buy some parts or buy some systems. It's just like we made our IDF, Indigenous Defense Fighters. Mm -hmm. Remember, this is the 1980s, and uh, for almost 10 years, we couldn't buy uh, the more advanced defense fighters, so we started building our own. Mm -hmm with American uh, technological uh, help. So uh, I think we're confident to build our own. We're very determined because we, we, we can't wait for, for another 13 years. Uh, as President Ma said, uh, uh, mainland China, we, we know this. Uh, they are our probably the biggest, biggest land of opportunities. Uh, we can trade with them. You know, We can do all kinds of peaceful engagement with them. But on the, on the other hand, we shouldn't forget, they are still our number one source of potential threat. So we need to also to consolidate our self-defense. We're not uh, trying to to start a arms race or whatever. You know, four submarines already obsolete, and they have almost 70 advanced submarines. This is already very, very imbalanced, and we need to at least do something to uh, to get some new, safer, what we call coastal defense submarines. Mm -hmm. so it's, it's, it's not offensive, it's, it's not uh, meant to, to uh, disturb the current, uh, uh, current situation in terms of military, um, in the military area. Um, so I, I think this is something we, we ought to do, and uh, it's been dragging on for too long. Too long. We, we can't wait for, as I said, another 13 years, and then the two submarines will be 84 years old. Mm, yeah. You don't want to drive a car already 84 <laughs> years old. You know that 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 be that could be a problem. That would be a problem. Yeah. Well, sir, I would like uh -huh. to thank you for for coming in today uh -huh. and doing this interview. Uh -huh. uh, with that, I think we will have to leave it there. Again, my uh -huh. name is Harry Kazianis from the National Interest. You have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. Is this okay?